Hello and welcome to Whispers in the Darkness, the paranormal podcast from Out There Paranormal. Whispering for you today, we have myself, Juliet Smith, and Nigel Higgins. In our previous nautical podcast, Ghosts of the Coast, we talked about strange goings on around our beautiful Norfolk beaches. This time, however, we're going to take a dive into the darkened depths to see what lies beneath. Our seas and oceans cover approximately 71% of the surface of the earth and are home to some amazing creatures, many of which are still being discovered. They are also home to many strange mysteries too. Interestingly, we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about what lies within our oceans. So, without further ado, it's time to down periscope and sound the dive alarm as we take a trip below the surface to explore the murky depths, taking you all on an undersea adventure full of mysteries and strange underwater experiences, all the way from cryptids to ghosts with a little UFO fun thrown in for good measure. It's positively a plethora of paranormal goodness for you to all enjoy. Our first story takes us back to 2003. We dive first into the Pacific Ocean as we bring you a tale with teeth. As part of an ongoing research study, a group of scientists in Australia tagged a mature, three metre long female great white shark. The tag was set to record ambient temperatures and depths and was securely placed in the shark's dorsal fin. After following the shark for a while, the team lost contact with the tag. Four months later, a beachcomber found the tag washed up, two and a half miles away from where it had been affixed to the shark. The tag was returned to the scientists, who decided to have a look at the data. Upon checking the tracking device, the scientists noticed that the shark had suddenly plummeted 1,900 feet in a matter of seconds, whilst its body temperature had rapidly increased by almost 20 degrees. Now this perplexed the researchers. The only explanation they could come up with. Something had swallowed the shark whole and rapidly plummeted into the watery depths. However, what creature could have swallowed a three-metre great white shark that quickly still remains a mystery to this day. Speculation says it was cannibalised by another great white. But imagine just how huge it must have been. Maybe, just maybe, the Meg movie was not fiction at all. Our next tale takes us north to the cold, dark depths of the Baltic Sea. Back in June 2011, a Swedish diving company called Ocean X was searching the depths for a shipwreck. Instead, they found something rather strange. At the bottom of the sea, measuring 70 metres in length, was a curiously shaped object quoted as resembling the Star Wars craft, the Millennium Falcon. The object showed up on sonar, resting a hundred meters down on the ocean floor. Now, what was interesting about this object was that it appeared to be located at the end of some kind of 300 meter long runway or tracks. 
Now many researchers and divers have put forward their ideas as to what this Baltic Sea anomaly truly is. Some have suggested it is a crashed UFO, but others have said it's part of a lost city, and some experts claim it is simply a natural rock formation. Now, whatever this item really is, the original divers from Ocean X are adamant that this is definitely not a natural finding. Stefan Hogeborn, part of the Ocean X team, advised that all their electrical equipment, including their satellite phone, malfunctioned and stopped working each time their boats were within 200 metres of this curious anomaly on the Baltic seabed. So what is this object? That's the thing. Nobody really knows. Whatever it is, it hasn't given up all of its secrets yet, and the debate rages on. Back out into the deep waters of the South Atlantic, just off the coast of St. Helena. To be a little more precise, we've taken a little trip further back in time to bring you the tale of an unusual creature that appears in many a nautical story. It's the 6th of August, 1848 and midshipman Satoris of the Royal Navy Corvette HMS Daedalus has just alerted the officers on the ship's quarter deck to an unusual sight. The captain, first lieutenant and sailing master were all somewhat surprised to see the approach of a large creature of a kind none had observed before. Captain Peter McHughey, in command of the vessel, described the encounter in his official report to the Admiralty. It was discovered to be an enormous serpent with head and shoulders kept about four feet constantly above the surface of the sea and as nearly as we could approximate by comparing it with the length of what our main top sail yard would show in the water there was at the very least 60 feet of the animal a fleur d'eau no portion of which was to our perception, used in propelling it through the water, either by vertical or horizontal undulation. It passed rapidly, but so close under our lee quarter, that had it been a man of my acquaintance, I should have easily recognised the features with the naked eye. Just another flight of fancy sea monster sighting you would think. Apparently not because on the 20th of September 1848, the American brig Daphne reported the sighting of a most extraordinary animal. It had the appearance of a huge serpent or snake with a dragon's head. Immediately upon it being seen, one of the deck guns was brought to bear, which having been charged with nails and whatever other pieces of iron could be got at at the moment, was discharged at the animal, then only distant about 40 yards from the ship. It immediately reared its head in the air and plunged violently with its body, showing that the charge had taken effect. The Daphne made towards the brute, which was seen foaming and lashing the water at a fearful rate. Upon the brig nearing, however, it disappeared. And though evidently wounded, made rapidly off at the rate of 15 or 16 knots an hour, as was judged from its appearing several times upon the surface. The Daphne pursued for some time, but the night coming on, the master was obliged to put about and continue his voyage. Now from the description given by the mate, the brute must have been nearly a hundred feet long. Where was this creature sighted? Well, it was just off the coast of St Helena in the South Atlantic. Theories about what the two ship's crews saw are many and various. It was either a seal or an oarfish or some kind of shark or whale or was it some floating seaweed or a log or perhaps even a whaler's abandoned canoe being pulled by something he had harpooned. 
but it was not and could not be a sea serpent or could it? Our last tale takes us to an ice cold stretch of the North Atlantic. It's Sunday the 14th of April 1912, roughly around 11.30 pm. The sky is clear and full of stars. The sea is dead calm, so calm in fact you could see the light of the stars reflected on the surface. On board the Titanic, everything was quiet. Most of the passengers had gone to bed. 95 foot above the deck, Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee were shivering in the crow's nest. They had been given orders to look out for icebergs as reports had come in saying there were many in the vicinity. At 23.39, Fleet spots an iceberg. He rings the lookout bell three times, telephones the bridge and tells them, Iceberg! Dead ahead! Sadly, his warning came too late and the starboard side of the Titanic hit the iceberg with a glancing blow. For seven long seconds, the ship ground along the edge of the iceberg, ripping a huge gash in the Titanic's hull. Five of the ship's supposed watertight compartments started filling up with water and the unsinkable ship started sinking. The lifeboats were hurriedly launched, containing women and children, but many of the lifeboats left the sinking ship only at half capacity. The passengers simply did not believe that the Titanic would sink and felt that they were safer staying on board, awaiting the help that never came. The ship was not equipped with enough lifeboats for the passengers. And as the ship started to sink, the boilers exploded and the lights went out, plunging the ship into complete darkness. The terrified screams of the remaining men, women and children on board the ship were heard as they Help fell us, into the icy waters of the Atlantic. Help. Captain Smith upheld his duty as captain and remained with the ship heading up to the bridge and slowly closing the door behind him. He was never seen again. The ship's stern and propellers then rose out of the water and at 2.20am the ship broke in two and sunk into the icy water. Desperate screams emanated from the icy waters. People cried for help, begging for survival, but the water was God, so cold. God, help us! And within a few minutes, the black coat was screaming. Silence. On the 15th of April at 2:20 a.m., the Titanic finally slipped below the waves, claiming the lives of more than 1,500 of the ship's 2,223 passengers on board. Owing to such a huge loss of life, and those passing in such distress, it is of no surprise that hauntings from the Titanic have been reported. Ships passing by the final resting place of the Titanic have reported seeing orbs, little balls of light hovering over the Titanic site. Submarines have also reported hearing strange signals and interference on their radios, including SOS messages that have no verifiable source. In 1977, Second Officer Leonard Bishop of the SS Winterhaven gave one of his passengers a tour of his ship. The passenger was a soft-spoken man with a British accent and was unusually attentive to detail. But something about the man struck Bishop as odd, but he couldn't quite put his finger on it. 
something seemed quite out of place. Now, years later, someone showed Bishop a picture of Captain Edward Smith and Bishop advised that he had met the man showing him around his ship. His companion laughed and advised it was impossible as the man was the captain of the Titanic. It is also said that Captain Smith haunts the home where he lived before the tragedy. The previous owners of the house confirm they have seen the ghost of Captain Smith in the bedroom and even reported a mysterious flood in the kitchen and an icy chill in the dining room. Many of the artefacts raised from the Titanic are also in the Titanic exhibition at the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas, USA. A replica of the Grand Staircase has been created and the ghost, the Black Lady, is often seen who wears a black period dress with a white collar and a hair in a bun, casually walking down the replica Grand Staircase. Now. As a matter of interest, and we're going off script here, Juliet has actually been to the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas and she's been to the Titanic exhibition and she has a story to tell about an experience she had at this very place. So I was lucky enough to visit the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas, USA and look at the Titanic exhibition there and guys seriously if you get the opportunity to go please go because it is worth it it's absolutely amazing um I found it incredibly emotional um they had all kinds of different artifacts they had hairbrushes spectacles you know even like bloomers and stuff like that cotton artifacts that you would have thought would be long gone by now and when you look at these people's personal artifacts it really gives you a feeling of these people and the fact it it was real and it wasn't just a story and they were real people and the thing that got to me the most was towards the end of the exhibition where they had centrally a very large block of ice and it was about one and a half meters to two meters tall. And they invited you to put your hand on the block of ice, which I did. And they said that was the temperature of the water that those poor unfortunate souls plummeted into. And obviously they didn't survive very long in the cold. And It was an incredibly moving experience for me, just imagining those poor people floating in that cold water in the darkness, those poor, poor souls, and how they ended their days. Of course, we cannot leave the Titanic without telling you two more stories attached to this great ship. The Wreck of the Titan, a novel written by Morgan Robertson 14 years before the fateful maiden voyage of the Titanic, tells the tale of a mighty ship that sinks after hitting an iceberg. Although the novel was written before RMS Titanic was even conceptualized, there are some uncanny similarities between the fictional and real life versions. Like Titanic, the fictional ship sank in April in the North Atlantic, 400 miles from Newfoundland, and there were not enough lifeboats for all the passengers. There are also similarities in size. 800 feet long for Titan versus 882 feet 9 inches long for the Titanic. Speed and life-saving equipment. After the Titanic sinking, some people credited Robertson with precognition and clairvoyance, which he absolutely denied. Now, to add another twist to this story, it is actually documented that Robertson 
had a dream about a very large ship sinking and wrote his book as a result of this. What do you think? A vision of the future or something else? The Carpathia was the only ship that managed to reach the crippled Titanic, rescuing 712 people. Its captain was one Arthur Henry Rostrum, who just happened to be a lifelong believer in the existence of sea serpents and other forms of cryptozoology. In fact, he had seen one himself, exactly five years before his Titanic exploits won him the praise and admiration of the world. In his memoirs, Home from the Sea, Commander Rostrum tells how he was acting as chief officer on board the Campania on April 26, 1907, when something remarkable happened. We were coming one Friday evening into Queenstown, when off Galley Head, I noticed something sticking out of the water. Keep clear of the snag right ahead! I called out to the junior officer who was with me on the bridge. We swung away at a point but gradually drew nearer so that we were able to make out what the unusual thing was. It was a sea monster. It was no more than 50 feet from the ship's side when we passed it. And so both I and the junior officer had a good sight of it. So strange an animal was it that I remember crying out, It's alive! One has heard such yarns about these monsters and cocked a speculative eye at the teller that I wished, as never before, that I had a camera in my hands. Failing that, I did the next best thing, and on the white dodger board in front of me, I made sketches of the animal full face and profile for the thing was turning its head from side to side for all the world as a bird will on a lawn between its pecks I was unable to get a clear view of the monster's features but we were close enough to realise its head rose eight or nine feet out of the water while the trunk of the neck was fully twelve inches thick We just love finding connections like these. Rostron's experience has got me thinking, so there will be a further article on our Patreon page touching on more sea serpent tales. So if you're interested in learning a little more about these strange creatures, come and join our Patreon group at www.patreon.com forward slash out there paranormal. So there you have it. Like we said at the very beginning, there's something for everybody in this series of tales. We have the whole gamut of paranormal experiences. We brought you ghosts, cryptozoology, UFOs, even a little bit of precognition and clairvoyance. So, there's only one thing left for us to do, and that's to say thank you for joining us once again. And it's a goodbye from me. And it's a goodbye from him. Goodbye. Sleep tight.